4 Samuel chapter 1 verse 1 to 18. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zephite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hara and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hara had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophini and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came from Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorstep of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow, saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Amen. Uh, this is the story of Hannah, the mother of uh, Judge Samuel. Samuel was the last judge of Israel. Judges were tribal leaders appointed by God to save Israelites when they are invaded by enemies. So they are uh, leaders, but they are not always, they're not leaders of uh, Israeli, Israelites 365, 24 hours a day. They work or act as leaders whenever Israelites are in trouble. So they're not kings. So they are not tribal leaders. They act as tribal leaders at the time of, you know, uh, invasions or troubles and dangers uh, to the people of Israel. So Samuel was the most famous judge because he was the last and he was also the one who anointed Saul, the first king, and also was the one who uh, allowed David uh, to be announced as the second king. So he's very famous. So uh, today, through the story of his mother Hannah, how she was able to give birth to this significant leader of Israel, right? we will learn the secret of a prayer that can move God's heart. You know, because every prayer that we give to God don't always get to be answered, right? Uh, there are many prayers that uh, don't get answered from God, which means they did not move God's heart. Or we were praying something that is not good for us. So from today's story, we will learn what made Hannah's prayer so special that she was able to move God's heart and got her prayer answered. Because according to the scripture today, God closed her womb, right? So God didn't allow her to have a child. But with Hannah's prayer, 
God's, God's heart was moved and gave her a son. You know, Hannah was a wife of a man named Elkanah. Elkanah had two wives. Today we don't have, uh, we don't usually have a man with uh, many wives because it's not the thing anymore. So anyway, he had two wives, Penina and Hannah. While Penina had children, he had sons and daughters, many children. Hannah did not have children because according to the Bible, God closed her womb. We don't know why. We don't know if it was God's plan or it was some, you know, punishment to uh, Hannah because it's not written. We don't know why. But anyway, God closed her womb. So she could not give birth to a child. Although Elkanah loved Hannah more and told Hannah that he does not care about her, you know, infertility and love her more than anyone, uh, Elkanah actually loved Hannah more than his uh, second wife, uh, Penina. Hannah was still heartbroken. Why? Because at that time, if a woman cannot give birth to a child, she is socially ashamed to be useless. She is being help, uh, helpless to household. She's not helping her husband because wife's job, not today, but at that time, wife's job, the only job is to give birth to her husband. She knew her husband loves her, of course, because uh, Elkanah always told, told Hannah that he loves her. But, uh, she was, uh, but that was the very reason that broke Hannah's heart. She was not able to help her beloved husband. She knew that uh, her husband really loves her, but she wanted want to help her husband by giving birth, but she could not give birth. So she was more heartbroken whenever Elkanah told her that he loves her more than anyone because she wanted to help her husband. She wanted to, you know, contribute to her husband's household. She could take, you know, she could be okay with Penina's, you know, acts like, you know, provoking her, irritating her. Sometimes she would rep, sometimes she wouldn't eat, but that's not the problem. That's not the reason why she was weeping. That's not the reason why she was heartbroken. The reason is whenever Penina provoked her, she was always reminded she's being pointless, helpless to her loving husband. So with her mournful heart, she had nothing to do but to turn to God. You know, what, what could she do, you know? She couldn't give birth to. No doctor can help her. Even today, when a woman cannot have birth to a child, it is difficult for that woman to give birth, right? My two sons, my twin sons, they're born out of, you know, test tubes. You know, we had medical help. But uh, first try, we failed because, you know, it is not difficult. So they were born after uh, second time of our uh, help from these test tube babies. They, they are called <laughs> what, what we call test tube babies. I have seen so many parents trying to these test tube babies. They fail. Usually they fail about average of four to five times. It is that difficult for women to give birth. So she turned to God. When Hannah went to the temple, she started to pray with tears. And during that time, priest Eli was watching her sitting by the doorpost of the temple. Now, when Eli observed her, Hannah was weeping and her lips were moving, but could not hear, Eli could not hear her uh, praying. There were no voices coming out from her mouth. And Ellie thought she must be drunken. So Ellie came to her and said, Stop whining, stop weeping. You're so drunk. Stop drinking. You see, from this, we can realize the difference between Hannah and Ellie's uh, definition of prayer. Now, Hannah was praying. We know that because it's written. But Ellie didn't recognize her as praying because Ellie could not see her as praying. Why? 
The simple answer for that is Ellie never seen anyone praying like that before. That's the reason. Ellie never saw a person praying with tears. Ellie, was, Ellie never saw a person deeply praying that no voice could come out. It was first time for Ellie to see someone praying like that. That's why Ellie could not recognize Hannah's praying. You see, Ellie had different concept about prayer. Well, now, at that time, it was common for people to pray in the temple publicly with loud voices. You know, when they go to the temple, they don't pray like, Oh, Lord, your name. No, they pray like, Oh, mighty God, our Savior, Lord, I have come. So they would pray in loud voice. Why? Because they want to be heard by other people. They want to be viewed as pious person. They want to be viewed as religious person. So why they are praying in loud voices? Because they want to tell others, right now I'm praying. Now listen to me. Listen to my prayer. How good I am. You know, sometimes when I uh, work, uh, deliver a sermon in English, I get really, you know, uh, nervous because I don't consider myself really good in English. But these people, they're so proud about themselves. So they would like pray in loud voice. Every, everybody could imagine how noisy it could be in the temple when people gather around and praying each other. So praying in little voice or no voice at all was considered to be pointless because nobody could hear them, right? So what it means is that people were more interested about how others saw them while in prayers rather than actually caring about not listening to them. So they didn't care if God is listening to them. They only cared what people might think when they're praying. So prayer became a religious formality. That's a problem. When something becomes formality, you don't find sincere heart in that, you know, you know, that, that, that act. So the prayer became just one of the religious process, process when you visit the temple. So they are not praying in heart. They're just following the tradition. Every year they will come to the temple, they will give sacrifice, and they will go to the front, of, front gate of the temple. Uh, since no more people cannot enter the temple, only priests can enter. They would just gather around in front of the temple, and they will just pray. But they're not sincerely praying. No, not praying at all, because it is just a process. Religious tradition as Israelites. So Eli, as a head priest of the temple, he's been seeing that all in his all life, he's been seeing people, you know, coming to the temple, praying in loud voice. And Eli, he himself was also praying in formality. So Eli was not praying truly. That is why when Eli saw Hannah praying sincerely and praying, you know, truly, pouring out her soul, as she said, praying in heart, Eli could not recognize Hannah as praying. This is the time when people began to rely on political powers and authority of men rather than God. You know, years later, this event, people uh, demanded the kingship, right? Samuel was the first uh, the judge who anointed Saul to be the first king of Israel. So already in this time, they were not truly believing God. They were not relying on God. They were not really worshiping God. They were not worshiping God. They were just following the tradition. Even the leaders of the church, Eli, the priest. A few weeks later, we are going to talk about Eli's son, two sons. They were priests, but they were not really you know, respecting God. So Eli was not really praying at all. Eli, who is supposed to be God's man, also must have been you know, considering the prayer as religious formality, as I said. So... His definition of prayer is not conversation with God. It's just formality. It's just religious thing. 
But for Hannah, different. She prayed differently than anyone else. She did not care what others think. She did not care uh, what others would listen. You know, all she cared about was to talk to God, to be heard to God. She was praying in her heart. She was, as she said, pouring out her soul in her prayer. She was praying sincerely. And so deeply and hardly, no voices were coming out from her heart. That was how much she was focusing on her prayer. You know, she wanted to be heard. And that moved God's heart. You see, what makes Hannah's prayer special is that she was not trying to make her prayer special. That's the point. To her, prayer was not a religious process, process to perform in the temple. It was not a religious formality that as a Israelite must follow. You know, she was sincerely talking to God. That's important. She was just expressing her feelings. Like a daughter in front of father. Or wife to a husband. You know, being earnest. Expressing her feelings, true feelings. She wanted to show her broken heart to God. She wanted to really show. That's why she was weeping. She wanted to really tell God what she need, what she need to heal her mourning broken heart. She moved God's heart because she gave her heart in her prayer. And that is the first secret of the prayer that moves God's heart. You know? Prayer pouring out the soul. Prayer expressing true feelings with nothing holding back. Don't hide it because you can't hide anything to God because God sees through us. God can see deep in our soul, our mind. Why do you hide? Because once you hide, God will know, wow, my daughter is lying to me. My son is lying to me. He's holding back. But I know what he's thinking. I know what's in his or her mind. Why is she or he holding back? Because God will know. You're not being earnest. How can you expect God to be, you know, answer your prayer when you're not being truthful, truthful enough? God does not ignore such prayer, the true prayer expressing your heart. He always listens to such prayer and always moved by such prayer. There are some times that you, we have to pray with formality, like praying in public for the whole community, right? But when you are praying personally, praying to God, you should be praying like Hannah. Because prayer is conversation with God. You know, when you're having conversation with someone, when you are trying to have deep conversation with someone, we express our feelings you know, earnest, earnestly, right? We give our true feelings, we give our true thoughts to the person when you are really trying to have conversation. And to our God, why shouldn't we? That is the first secret. Next, in her prayer, Hannah makes a vow. This is very important. Hannah makes a vow. She makes the faithful vow to offer her son to God as Nazarite. Nazarite, this is important. Nazarite is a person you know, who dedicates himself or herself to God, you know, to, to dedicate himself to be you know, sacred, separate, living a different life. It is to separate oneself from you know, secular desires and Dedicate his or her life completely to God. There are certain rules that you have to keep, like not cutting your hair, not drinking any alcohol, you know, or serving, you know, uh, God in the temple, or so, so on and so on. But the most famous, the most uh, rule that needs to be kept was to not cut hair. So she said uh, she'll not put any razor to her son, right? Uh, one can also become uh, uh, 
Nazirite through the vow, vow of his or her parents. So you don't have to vow yourself to uh, God to become Nazirite. Your parents can make a vow and make you Nazirite. You know, one can be a Nazirite for a certain period of time. You can be like seven months Nazirite, a year Nazirite, or seven years or so on. But you can also be Nazirite for entire life. So who's the most uh, famous Nazirite? Samson. Samson, the, the really famous. Samson was also Nazirite. But he, should not, he couldn't cut his hair. hair. But when he cut his hair, he lost his power, right? So Nazirite is also a sacred per person who, you know, separate himself from a secular thing. But sometimes he will act as hero. So Nazirite can also be superhero for Israelites, like Samson. Sometimes they will become a warrior because he's uh, considered to be very sacred and considered to have some superpowers. God would actually grant this Nazareth some uh, special uh, talents, like Samson. So, for Hannah, she's offering a future-born son to God. You know, now for Hannah, when God finally grants her son, wouldn't Hannah want to spend her time with her son, right? Wouldn't her son be very precious? Because considering the fact that she was really mourning for years she couldn't have a son when finally God gives her son her son would be most precious thing for Hannah right you know for a mother it is happiness and joy uh, happiness and joy come from watching her children growing up you know feeding her child you know teaching her child, you know, making her grow. And it is the most blissful thing to watch your child become an adult, right? That's the happiness of a mother. And now she's offering that happiness of being mother to God. So she's actually offering something, the most important thing for her, the thing that she's actually asking from God, she's offering to it. All to glorify the name of God. She's not just giving himself, her, her son to be some soldier. She's uh, allowing, uh, offering her son to be Nazarite. Nazarite is a person who's being, uh, who's dedicating his or herself to God, right? So she's making a vow to glorify God. That's the special thing. That is the second secret to the prayer that moves God's heart. To make the vow for the, uh, for the glory of our Lord. That's the secret. In the prayer, that always moves God's heart. We can make so many vows. We can make vows like, I'm going to you know, offer my entire position to you know, help the people who are in need. We can make a vow, but, or sometimes I can uh, make a vow to uh, make my children be a doctor and be uh, helpful to the people of this world. But sometimes it is not directly connected to glory of our Lord. But Hannah is making a vow that has everything to do with God's glory. Because Hannah is offering her son to be Nazarite. So when we are making vow in our prayer, we should be making vow to glorify our Lord. The purpose of your vow must be glorifying the name of our Lord. Sometimes we make a vow that's actually good for us. You know, like, you know, if you help me, I'll become, if you give me so many talents, I will make a really good business and I will become rich, you know. Powerful, and I will give you uh, portions of my, you know, income to you as an offering. It may seem like you're actually growing, glorifying your God, but you are actually making a vow to make yourself rich and powerful because you gain more. This is not a contract. You know, making a vow to God is not a contract. You give me something valuable, 
then I will give you valuable something, something valuable to me, to you. This is not a mutual contract. That shouldn't be the vow. The vow must always to glorify God completely, whether you get something out of it or not. Hannah is actually losing everything, right? Because she's offering her only son. But is it really minus four? No. She can finally help you know, her husband's household by giving birth to a man. And actually, we know Samuel. Everybody knows Samuel who reads Bible, right? Samuel became very famous. And you know, when a person, person's name is known to the descendants, that is great honor, right? Because of Samuel, Hannah and Elkanah is known to everyone. So is it really lost for Hannah to offer uh, her son to God to become Nazareth? No. She was able to be written in the Bible. The greatest honor a man can have. Did Hannah was respecting this? No. Did Hannah want it to be known to all people around the world? No. She was only making a vow to glorify God's name. That's the point. And that always makes God's heart, moves God's heart because it's pleasing to God. Think about it. It's really pleasing. If someone comes to you, you know, I'm going to do something to you know, make your name famous, won't you be really satisfied? Or if a person uh, is satisfied with such an act, how much God would be uh, satisfied? You know, I can approve this because I also had a similar vow when I was a, a child. I wasn't a particularly healthy uh, child. And I wasn't really smart. And, you know, as a child, I really had this worry that I might die early because <laughs> I was really weak. And uh, I also had this worry that I would, I would not be a person, you know, worthy being, you know, help to people. So when I was a child, I made a vow to God. You know, the vow was that if you allow me to survive long days, and take care of me until I die, I will become the tool of your missions. I will become men of God. You know, I wouldn't do anything else, but will become your tool. And once I made that vow, God helped me through everything. You know, there were so many times that I was, you know, threatened to be uh, a die, uh, to be. Uh, death because I got so many diseases in the when I was in the Philippines those fatal diseases are you uh, aware of dengue mosquito dengue fever dengue fever's death rate is I think it was above 70 percent I got that fever was over 40 degrees I was lying I think half a month every time I got this uh, strange this is that is not even known to men. I would always, you know, lie in a bed about half months or month. You know, I would all, or constantly go to a, a emergency room because I was sick every time. But even that, they couldn't stop me. You know, God allowed me to, you know, survive until now. And I wasn't really a particularly smart person, but God helped me through all my education. I graduated two colleges and two uh, graduate colleges. I didn't like reading books. I didn't like studying, but God allowed me to have uh, uh, graduate all the colleges and even get you know scholarship. I don't know how I get that, but <laughs> I was able to go through all that, all all of that to make me an ordained pastor. God kept me promise because I made that vow. But it was all to glorify his name. Because I am nothing. But with my life, I can glorify my Lord God. Because a person like me can become a leader. Then you can do too when you are worshiping God. That's the point. So Hannah made a vow to glorify God. That is the second secret. Always make a vow. 
not for your sake, but to glorify God's name. And God will always be moved, and God will always answer the prayer. But of course, you must be sincere with the vow. If you're lying, God will know. If you're not truthful about your vow, God will know. So don't ever try to lie to God. That won't work. And after her prayer and conversation with Ellie, Hannah gets the answer from her prayer, uh, for the prayer, for her prayer through Ellie's blessing. Now, it was blessing from a priest who did not even recognize Hannah's praying. A priest who was spiritually blind. But Hannah took it as an answer from God. You know, Ellie may be an unworthy priest, but he is still the priest, right? Anointed by God. And God still blessed Hannah through this unworthy priest. And Hannah respected Ellie to be the priest of the temple. So, quick reminder. Since we are in an election week, when God anoints someone to be his tool, whether the person is good or bad, that person is still God's tool. Do not forget that. It could be, the, it could be for good reason or it could be for bad reason. You know? When a person is being elected by God to be leaders, God used that person. So it is not for us to judge him or her or even to punish the person. It is God's job. Because why? God is the only one who made that person a leader. We might think that person is not worthy. We might think that person is not worthy enough to be the per, uh, leaders. But still, God will work through that person. That's what's happening right now. Ellie, even though spiritually blind, Ellie, even though he's not really priest at all, spiritually, but he's still anointed to be the priest. So God is using Ellie's lips to answer Hannah's prayer. You know, we consider our Korean uh, Christian community being, you know, really not being church at all. Sometimes we criticize all those religious leaders. But yes, we can criticize them, but we should still respect them to be the leaders. Why? Even Jesus didn't do it. You know, when Jesus, he was doing his mission for three years, he constantly criticized religious leaders, right? But he never fought against them. Jesus still respected religious leaders as their, uh, as people of Israel, as religious leaders. And God worked through them. Even though it was not a good purpose, because God used religious leaders to crucify Jesus Christ to complete the salvation mission, but God still used them, and Jesus respected them. So let's remember that. Now back to our final secret. Hannah, when she got her answer, she truly believed her prayer was answered. That's very important. I mean, completely she believed it. Now, she did not get the exact date or if she would get daughter or her son. Actually, uh, Ellie said, you're blessed and uh, I hope your prayer will be answered. She didn't get even rough day when she will get the, uh, her son, but she believed it. She didn't have any doubt in her heart. You might think it is easy, but it is not. Before her prayer, she was not eating, she was mourning, and entire her time visiting the temple of Shiloh, she was not you know, eating, and she was heavy on her face. But after her prayer, she ate her food, and she did not have any worried looks, as if nothing happened before. Why? Because she was completely in faith to her prayer being answered. Now that is the final secret. Believe that your prayer has been answered. You know, have no doubt in your heart. If you swear like uh, some uh, uh, a tree or some plants, God is gonna. God is going to be like, 
you know, I already answered your prayer. Why are you, you know, having doubt in your heart? You know, because of your doubt, I'm not going to answer your prayer because you're not being faithful to me. You don't want that, right? So Hannah, she didn't believe, uh, she didn't have any doubt in her heart. She completely believed her uh, prayer already answered. That is the final secret to the prayer that moves God's heart. You know, think about it. Most of the time, when you uh, review your life, when you review your prayer sessions, the, uh, the prayers that's been answered will always be the prayer that you believe to be answered. We know this. Sometimes it is hard because you're living in this world of deception. We're living in the world of uh, a sinful world and doubtful world, world that makes us doubtful. We will have doubt in your heart, but never doubt God. No, we can doubt your parents, we can doubt your own uh, wife or your own husband, your children, you can doubt because they are persons, they're people. They're not perfect, but never doubt God because God is perfect, because God is infinite. God does not make mistakes. God does not forget. When God says, I'm going to answer your prayer, God will answer your prayer one way or the other. It could not be the way you expected, but still your prayer will be answered. So why worry? God will answer your prayer one way or another. God might answer your prayer with voices. That is very special because not so many around the world get their prayer to be answered because sometimes you know, there's this really funny joke. Uh, there was this... Uh, uh, pastor who was praying every morning about this prayer topic. I don't know what, what topic it was. And, and he was, God, speak to me. And he would always pray in the morning, God, speak to me. And one day, God finally <laughs> answered his prayer in the voice, you know, the godly voice. Yes, I'm here. What do you want? And what happened was he got heart, <laughs> heart attack because he was so surprised and he died. So, believe in the prayer. Because he was not really believing his prayer. <laughs> because when God finally answered his prayer, he, he was really surprised and heart attacked. So, believing in the prayer is the third secret. So, remember these secrets. Do you want your prayer to be answered? Be like Hannah. Follow these three secrets. You need help from God? Pray like Hannah. You know, with these secrets, you will always, you will surely experience the wonder of our Lord, God's blessings in your prayer. I promise that. So I bless you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that your prayers be all answered. Let us pray.